Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, because we know there are always people from around the world logging on to these uh, infrastructure intelligence live events. Um, welcome to everybody, and a particularly warm welcome to um, our guest uh, this afternoon, um, who is the chair of the Climate Change Committee, uh, Lord Deben. Uh, uh, you're very welcome, uh, and thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today for what I hope will be an interesting and insightful discussion on all matters related to climate change, the environment, net zero, uh, and maybe a few other things um, uh, besides. Um, just before we uh, kick things off, um, for those that aren't aware, um, the Climate Change Committee is an independent uh, body that was established under the Climate Change Act uh, 2008, and its purpose is to ad advise the UK and the devolved governments on emissions targets and to report to Parliament on the progress that those um, uh, administrations make in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also preparing for and adapting to the impacts of climate change. And as I say, we're very fortunate today um, at this infrastructure intelligence live event that as always we're organizing in association with our strategic partners, BECG, to be joined by Lord uh, Deben. Um, who, as I said, is chair of the Climate Change Committee. Um, I nearly said in a previous life, but, but that's a, you know, a somewhat strange term to use sometimes, because I don't think um, the Lord's um, uh, commitment to environmental issues has ever wavered, really, as I'm sure we'll find out during the course of this conversation. But Lord Deben um, um, w uh, was the UK's longest serving Secretary of State for the Environment, um, back in 1993 to 1997, and he's held a number of other high ministerial posts, including the Secretary of State for Agriculture, uh, Fisheries um, and, uh, and Food. He's also worked under and with a number of uh, British uh, Prime Ministers, and I think it's fair to say that he has been an advocate, a strong advocate uh, for the environment uh, and uh, for, the, uh, for speaking out on the perils of um, um, climate change, the harm done by climate change for many, uh, for many, many years. And as I said, we're really grateful to uh, have him with us um, this afternoon. Uh, Lord Deben also founded and chairs uh, the corporate responsibility consultancy, Sandcroft, which works with uh, many companies around the world to help them improve their environmental, social uh, and ethical uh, impact. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to kick off um, with our first question. Um, and just to say to um, our audience, if you do have any questions, then just post them in the chat. If you want to put your organization's name in there as well, then please do so. Uh, I'm more than happy to, uh, to see where, you know, you know, where those questions are coming from. Uh, but Lord Deben, first of all, you're someone who's got a wide experience and, and, and knowledge of government and how the system works. What made you uh, in the first instance, get involved in tackling climate change, and what first brought you, um, you know, to this um, to this subject? Well, I mean, it was literally the science. I'd um, uh, I had begun to read about it when I was the number two, the Minister of State in the Ministry of Agriculture, and I was responsible for the um, state of our sea defences. And uh, as one does, I read around this and uh, became convinced that it looked as if the climate was changing. There were not quite so many examples then as there are now, but it did look so. And, and I also had the very simple concept that um, if the way that the earth became cool enough for, first of all, plants and then um, uh, animals and then finally human beings to live on it, if it became cool enough by taking the carbon out of the atmosphere, it seemed to me to be pretty obvious that if you put it back into the atmosphere, which is what you do if you use coal and, uh, and, and oil, then it might have the opposite effect, so that one at least ought to have a look out for it. And then I had to make decisions about the height of our sea defences, um, and decided that uh, we should make them higher because I thought that the sea rise was very likely. And as you may know, it now looks as if we've had a 20 centimetre 
rise in the sea levels uh, even already. So it was quite a sensible thing to do. And you're someone who, um, just before we came on live, you know, we were talking about um, your long-standing advocacy for the environment where, you know, shall we say that advocacy of some of these issues was not as mainstream or as popular as it appears to be now. I mean, how did you gain an audience, I suppose? How did you persuade people way back in the day that actually what you were talking about was real, was a threat and needed addressing? Well, I was very lucky because Mrs. Thatcher was a scientist and she had uh, begun to believe in climate change, calling it global warming in those days, but she'd begun to believe it in the 80s, um, being convinced by the science. And we were very fortunate to have a scientist as prime minister. It's very rare, but we happened to have it. And I always remember him, her saying when I said, well, well, we have a bit of difficulty over doing this thing to raise the sea defences or new sea defences to be rather higher from the Treasury. And I always remember her saying to me, well, she said, John, there are two people in my government who believe in global warming, you and me. We are therefore a majority. So go ahead. <laughs> it was very clear that uh, her support was, was very important. But then the other thing was, of course, of course, the scientists were beginning to move to understand this and they were beginning to influence other people. And uh, one of the great advantages we had in Britain was that uh, this was not a left right division. It was uh, uh, across the board that people believed in it or didn't believe in it. And so gradually, uh, right up to the point of the Climate Change Committee being set up under the Climate Change Act. We have had an all party agreement on it. And that's why we've been able to do more than many countries, more than the United States, and more than Australia, for example. How do you think that all party um, consensus has actually developed? Because obviously you could argue they're on a whole series of other issues, uh, major infrastructures, one of them, of course, uh, that um, national policy would benefit for such a con consensus? Is it because the scientists, as you uh, assert just there, were, were listened to earlier? Yeah, I think it was that. And I think it was there was one remarkable piece of opportunity, and that was that um, the when the Conservatives were in opposition, uh, they produced a climate change bill. And they did it in association with Friends of the Earth. Uh, and they got everybody else on the opposition side, the nationalists and the Liberal Democrats, and everybody else to agree to that. And then presented it to the government and said to the government, we don't want this to be a party political thing. Uh, we want the government to introduce this act. M mind you, they, they did say, and we've got 100 Labour members of Parliament who will vote for it, so if you don't introduce it, we will, and we'll win, and that won't be a good idea for you. There was a certain amount of perfectly reasonable political bargaining here. Anyway, Gordon Brown took it, introduced it. Um, it was, um, uh, uh, as you know, Ed Miliband, who was the uh, Secretary of State for... Uh, for energy and climate change. And uh, from that day onwards, because it had support right across uh, the chamber and because the opposition had not tried to make it a party political thing, I think we, we have managed to maintain that. And I get very cross when people try to take um, party advantage on it. And I remind them that I um, was appointed by a liberal democrat minister in a conservative coalition by the first minister of wales who was a socialist the first minister of scotland who was a scottish nationalist and the first minister of the north of ireland who was a protestant unionist and they chose me who was a conservative and a catholic so <laughs> we didn't do too badly that way on independence and this helps enormously um i think you know the point that you made there about um, you know, cross-party, um, you know, sort of alliances on this particular issue is, is one that I think, you know, is is really important. And you mentioned um, there, you know, in comparison with uh, America, where, you know, famously, um, 
the the well, I, I suppose he still is the current president, uh, Donald Trump, took uh, the US out of the Paris Agreement. Just reflect on recent events there and what you think that means for um, the you know the fight against um, uh, climate harms with the um, soon to be announced victory or official victory of Biden and his. Uh, very well publicised assertions around going back into the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Do you think, presumably, you, you welcome that as a development in terms of what that means for climate? Well, it's hugely important. I mean, America has rejoined the world. I mean, the, the, the issue was that uh, Donald Trump was a, a lone voice in the uh, major countries of the world, followed, uh, I'm afraid, by Mr. Bolsonaro in uh, in, in, in Brazil. But apart from that, he was a lone voice. And the world would have gone ahead without the United States, particularly as quite a number of states in the United States and quite a number of cities are already doing the things that they have to do in order to combat climate change. So you can't say that the United States was without uh, change. The other thing is that Oddly enough, Mr. Trump had not realized, or perhaps just didn't want to realize, that very large numbers of major American companies have accepted climate change and are busy working themselves to become net zero. I mean, there are, are some which haven't learned that yet, uh, very often for pretty selfish reasons, like ExxonMobil, for example, who, who still haven't followed the route of uh, of good and great uh, companies in the area like Repsol, like uh, BP, who have actually recognized that they don't want to be left with stranded assets. They've got to become a different kind of company if they're going to be the sort of company they are now. But uh, there are many American companies which really are taking a lead, surprising ones, ones you wouldn't immediately think of. I mean, Coca-Cola. Uh, for example, with whom we have worked in my business uh, very extensively, were one of the first companies to say, well, we've actually got to face the issue, although they didn't use the words to start with because it was not very popular, but they did understand what it was about. And so they've now gone to get rid of um, HFCs in their refrigeration. They've uh, started to make sure that every drop of water they take out, they put back in. So all these things um, are happening in the United States and Biden can play into it. But I, I do think it's a remarkable thing that um, this country is going to be part of the central discussion from now on. OK, um, tell us a little bit about the current work of the um... Committee on Climate Change, um, you know, you know, you current, what's it currently doing? And also, I think a lot of our uh, listeners and viewers would be interested. Do you feel that the government is actually listening on these issues as well? What's your view on that? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I think this government is is listening. Um, I mean, I, I'm not without very considerable criticism of the government on a whole lot of other things. So nobody could possibly say that I'm patsy as far as the government's concerned. But, but um, uh, Boris Johnson and his ministers have certainly been saying the right things. And quite a number of things that they've done have been the right things, including Rishi Sunak, the, the Chancellor's uh, very significant support, both in his one year programme and also his announcements about uh, people having to uh, report on these subjects. Uh, so, I mean, I, I see a government which is certainly wanting to do the right things. The issue now is ensuring that those right things are actually done. So we will be producing what is called the sixth carbon budget. Uh, every five years, we produce a new budget uh, and parliament debates it and then decides whether to uphold it or not. And if if they uphold it, as they have all five of the first ones, then it becomes law and it also cannot be changed without the Independent Climate Change Committee agreeing. So this gives us permanence and a certainty and a settlement about these things, which is hugely important for your readers, for example. Um, anybody in infrastructure is in the business of planning in the long term. That's a very difficult thing to do in any case, uh, 
And you need as much certainty as you can have because there are all sorts of uncertainties which you can't get rid of. Uh, the one thing in Britain is that you have a certainty because we now will have uh, budgets which will say exactly how much we have to reduce our emissions, will advise in what areas those should be and what the policies should be. And we've got those now towards until towards the end of the 2030s. Well, now that gives Britain a huge advantage over other countries. And we've seen that happen because the government created that marketplace with this background that has meant that we now have uh, all this offshore wind technology. We've got a lot of jobs here from onshore wind. And we were a bit late getting onto it, but once we had got onto it, it's there and it really uh, is strengthening. The government has committed itself to 40 gigawatts of extra um, uh, 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 offshore wind. It's also talked about uh, encouraging at long last onshore wind, allowing that to play a part in it and so, uh, more solar. So we, we are going down that route and business is able to do that. And so what I'm absolutely uh, chock-a-block with at the moment is completing the sixth carbon budget. I've got a very good team. We've gone out to the best experts in the world. The Climate Change Committee itself is entirely made up, apart from myself, of scientists and economists, just eight or nine of us. Um, and, and we're well on the way to doing that. And I have no doubt that the government will recognize that this is the, the very sensible way in which to meet its already accepted target of getting Britain to net zero by 2050. So I have every expectation that the government will accept this and start doing the things that we have to do to uh, meet the new sixth carbon budget. I'm glad you mentioned um, the, the, the issue of, 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 of wind. Uh, because the, 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 the government's policy regarding wind farms does seem to be a very promising one, particularly at a time when there's a lot of talk about um, levelling up the economy, particularly in a post-COVID environment. What do you think um, that policy around, uh, around wind uh, you know, will mean for the economies of the North and also Scotland? You know, do, do you have any views on that? Well, I think that the wind policy uh, gives a real security to the industry. The industry itself is very, uh, very strong in the east of England and in Scotland. So that will be extremely good. But there's a good deal of work that's being done in the Irish Sea and off the uh, on the northwest. So there's a this is spread well. But the, the other part of the policy, which will be extremely good for levelling up is the program that we have uh, very much insisted on, which is that we should um, reduce our energy, our, the amount of energy we use. We need energy efficiency and better forms of heating in our homes. And uh, that is a program which demands not only new infrastructure in many areas, but it also demands a great deal of uh, renovation and retrofitting, which is something which provides jobs, and you can make sure that those jobs are largely in the places which are short of jobs, and helping those who are poorest off and, uh, and, and fuel poor in particular. Uh, the other thing, as far as infrastructure is concerned, um, is that, of course, um, we're going to have to change the way in which our houses are built. Uh, the only real scandal, I think, has been that because the government, which I have praised in other areas, was entirely wrong when it uh, stopped the decision to have zero carbon homes. It did that. And the result of that is that we've built a million homes since then, which will have to be retrofitted because they are not fit for the future. And the awful thing that does is that the people who bought those homes now have an annual bill for energy, which is far, far higher than it ought to be. And I do think the house builders should be ashamed of themselves because what they've done is to take the money today and give the bills for tomorrow. Now, changing that is going to be difficult. 
we've we've already committed ourselves and it's been brought as far as i understand it the government is very determined to bring it in we've committed ourselves to say that after 2025 um, you won't be able to commit uh, housing and connect housing to um, fossil fuel infrastructure. Now, there's a lot of uh, need for new infrastructure in that place, a lot of concept of uh, uh, district heating, uh, uh, the installation of um, air, um, uh, air uh, forced heat pumps um, and, and ground source heat pumps too. Uh, all sorts of new technology which is there and which will mean major infrastructure changes if they are to be really successful, not least in strengthening our grid, making it possible for the electric cars, which will be universal after about 2030, 2032, um, to not only plug in to take energy out, but also to be a store for energy. All that is very exciting for the infrastructure industry. Going back to um, the government's um, policies on this, um... I read in the newspapers uh, just the other day that the um, that the prime minister will be announcing this ten point plan for net zero um, quite soon. Um, are you confident that that will be a bold and deliverable plan? And also, uh, how might we, as an infrastructure and construction industry, hold the government's feet to the fire, if you like, and I suppose support the CCC in his effort in its efforts? Uh, and that's. Um, that's a question that's come from uh, Charles Malassard from WSP. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, first of all, um, uh, WSP is setting a pretty good example of that. It's, it is a company in your industry which has really shown the way in a remarkable manner. Um, uh, so keeping the government's foot to the fire, feet to the fire is, is first of all, uh, always being there with answers rather than... Uh, uh, demands or questions. The problem with governments is that they're not very good at listening to questions and, 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 and problems, but if you go along to them with an answer, and that's what the industry can do, okay, whatever it is that, uh, uh, that the Prime Minister announces in its 10-point plan or whatever it is, um, the first thing that the industry needs to do is to say, right, that's what we'll do and we'll deliver it. And this is how you do it. And this is we can do all this ourselves, but we need certain kinds of government support. And one of the kinds of government support we need is proper regulation. Um, you know, I mean, I sit as a Tory and I've always been a conservative. I've always believed also in good regulation. I don't like too much regulation. I don't want to have regulation when you don't need it. But I do think roads are safer if you insist that people drive on the left hand side instead of on both hand side. You need regulation. See, they really are important. And so I'll be looking very much, and I hope the industry will too, to the sort of regulation that makes it possible for people to compete properly on a level playing field. And that means, for example, uh, new regulations as to the standard of house building, of commercial building, so that people do have to build to a common base standard. I think one of the big problems of some of your members is that, the, that they do what the government says in trying to be very green, and then when they, when they compete for a government, um, uh, some, some of the government wishes to procure, they find the government doesn't choose them, but chooses a company which is not green. So one of the things I want to see from the government is that its procurement policy, and after all, it's a huge amount of money every year, that its procurement policy becomes absolutely in tune with its commitment to fighting climate change. And that means you don't get the jobs unless you are trying to do your part in uh, fighting climate change. Well, I think that's a really interesting point, and I think I can almost hear people um, in, in the background, you know, thinking about the procurement policies, and often, um, you know, there are issues around um, cheapest price as well, which is obviously an ongoing uh, an ongoing issue. But I think at the end of the day, I suppose you do get what you pay for um, as well, and and that kind of moves me on to my next question, and that is. Um, and it's the first mention we've done quite well. We're 27 minutes in and we're only mentioning uh, 
I think I did briefly mention COVID earlier on, but I'm going to mention it now quite overtly. And, and I think the crisis has shown the ability or the need for the government to intervene, particularly in the economy, where it's obviously spent, you know, quite eye watering sums, you know, necessary sums in order to keep things afloat. Is there, do you think, a message there, though, uh, you know, for the, um, uh, you know, for net zero and, and, and the fight against the effects of climate change is that actually if you do want to do something right, then you do actually need to finance it properly in order to get the right result. Well, I think the first thing that is obviously true is that COVID has moved this whole agenda on very much. Uh, pandemics, when you're in them, rather give you the impression that the world is going to change entirely. The truth is, it never changes like that. What happens is that pandemics have always speeded up what was already there. So all this demand for ESG, I found that in my business life, all the sustainability demands were already there. We were already working with these companies. But what has happened because of COVID is that it's become more intensive and uh, investors are much more interested now in making sure that the companies in which they put their money are sustainable. And one of the elements of sustainability is that they take into account and obviously take seriously the whole question of climate change, because um, that's affecting uh, supply chains, as we know very well, as COVID has. So um, I, I think this has moved us on very considerably. And it's also shown that the sorts of ways in which we get out of the um, economic problems which COVID has brought upon us and the ways which we fight climate change are the same things. So the investment that we do for the one is the investment we have to do for the other. And that investment, if you add it all together, is going to be less than 2% of the gross national product. We're, we're talking about uh, a, a sum which is perfectly possible for the private sector and the government between it, but largely the private sector to provide. And at a time of low interest rates, with quite a lot of money looking for the right places to invest, this is the ideal time for that to happen. But to return to your question, it only happens if the government sets the parameters and the example, if it procures in a way which encourages that, and if it which, and as long as it sticks to it, 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 the danger of government is it always allows the perfect to be the enemy of the good. So it starts off on the right uh, course, then it thinks it can improve it a bit, by which time it then upsets everybody's fundamental commitments and changes it, what it thinks is just a little, but in a way which is very disruptive for industry. So the thing I'll be pushing the government to do is not only to carry out the necessary changes, not only to create the right kind of parameters, but also to stick to it and not be put into the position in which you think I can always improve this. I can always do a little twist there and a little bit there. And move. That's not how it does. Those of us who run big businesses, whom I'm lucky enough to have done that, those of us who've been in business all our lives, we know perfectly well that the thing you need is certainty, security, and continuity. And it is better to have things that are slightly less than the perfect, but there and happening and going on and people feeling happy about them than to constantly to change. Um, that's an interesting point. Uh, and, 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 and what was also interesting, you mentioned earlier about housing uh, and, 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 and you were critical of the housing sector there uh, earlier uh, in, in, in relation to, you know, some of his activities. And um, it, it just reminded me that the, we reported this morning uh, on our website about the latest report from the Green Alliance, um, which said that the government's infrastructure policy wasn't fit for net zero. Um, because it was there was a danger of saddling taxpayers and communities with unsuitable infrastructure that worsens climate change. How do we, well, one, do you think that's a possibility? And two, how do we actually avoid that other than just saying, well, the government shouldn't do it? How do, how do, we, how do we do that? Well, first of all, 
it's a possibility um, and it's the possibility which would be worst because if you saddle a nation with infrastructure which is unsuitable to fight climate change and then you find yourself you've got to fight climate change all you do is to saddle yourself with a very large bill um, and so we don't want to do that and I think the government doesn't intend to do that but it means that you've got also to make major changes about infrastructure in the right ways uh, one of the areas is the whole issue of um, electricity distribution and making the grid suitable for a situation which is very different from what it used to be. First of all, we need to generate a lot more electricity. Secondly, there'll be a lot more localized generation. You've got to have a grid that's flexible enough to deal with that. And we've also got to have a grid that operates sensibly for offshore wind. I mean, one of the problems about offshore wind is that nobody thought terribly hard about how you bring it onshore. And indeed, we have very outdated rules so that you have to bring each of the arrays onshore yourself in a competitive way. That's a darn stupid way of doing it. What we need to have is a proper ring main system into which uh, people can link, which uh, will give uh, security for the future and won't be a means of destroying beautiful villages all the way down the east coast of England. Now, I speak with a certain amount of um, interest here because I live in the East Coast and these villages are lovely villages and many of them I used to represent in Parliament. The last thing I want them to do is that having put offshore wind in order to protect the countryside was one of the reasons, um, we then have uh, very large installations like those that are proposed, not because we need them, but because the law is out of date. And that's why it's got to be changed. And we need Ofgem to in, implement new rules, which the government's got to give. Is that something that the CCC would take a view on and actually try and nudge the government in that positive direction? Uh, we've made that very clear to the government because the fact is that um, it, it isn't just a question of uh, protecting Britain's countryside and biodiversity, although I do think that's important. I mean, for me, this you asked me right at the beginning why I was driven about climate change. For me, the climate change is uh, best described in the words of the Pope. When the Pope produced his encyclical Laudato Si five years ago, one of the things he said in it, it was an illustration which I, I, I knew instinctively but had never thought out, which was that climate change is a symptom of what we've done to the world. It's, so it's a symptom of the disease and we have to, when, when you don't cure symptoms, you cure the disease. And the disease has been that we've, um, we've ruined our soils and uh, reduced their fertility. We've, um, uh, we've attacked our biodiversity and reduced the uh, marvelous variety of things that we have. Uh, all those things have got to be put right. And if you're going to do that, then you have to have an attitude towards um, uh, this whole issue, which is inclusive. So when the Climate Change Committee talks about uh, having a sensible mechanism for bringing offshore wind onshore, of course its prime purpose is that that's the only way to make it effective, efficient, and help in the battle against climate change directly. But indirectly, of course, you want to protect the areas of the east of England from yet further depredation, because that's precisely the disease from which we are suffering. Talking about diseases and symptoms, which is sadly topical for Indeed. other reasons at the moment, I want to turn to the issue of transport and a couple of areas in particular, because obviously that is a key um, uh, you know, potential you know, harm causer, really, in terms of um, damage to the environment. Um, I've got a question from Graham Earl uh, around the aviation sector, and he's asking, has your view on the level of emissions from UK aviation changed at all since the publication of the CCC's net zero report? And specifically, he says, the need for any further new airport capacity in the UK. Uh, maybe that's a slightly different context now, given <laughs> where we are with COVID. But your views on that, first of all, and then I'll turn to something else on transport. 
Well, first of all, it's not for us to say whether there should be a new airport or not a new airport. It's for us to say how much elbow room is there in the uh, uh, budget for aviation. And we have specifically laid that down and we aren't moving from that. Uh, if the government decides that it wants to use up some of that space by building a new airport, wherever it is, I'd only say two things. One is that that means there's less for other things. And because you can't uh, increase that envelope, it's already as big as it could be made. Um, and if you try to increase it, you'd only have to make life intolerable for other people in other industries. Um, and the second thing one would say is that it does mean that if you, for example, were to build a third runway in London, it means there's no new runway anywhere else. I mean, you know, that is that is the that's the that that means you've used it up, so to speak. And I don't think governments are always very good at telling people that if they do X, they can't do Y. Now, all of us in our marriages know perfectly well that that is the most embarrassing moment. It's when either husband says to wife or wife says to husband, can we afford this? And the answer is, yes, we can afford this, but not if we do that. Um, it's, not, it's not both and, it's one or. Now, what most people want you to say is that you can both afford this and go on doing whatever it was that you wanted to do in the first place. Now, that I'm afraid is the government's rather inclined to do the same thing. They, they, they tell you about the good things, but not perhaps the bad things. And that's a part, non-party political comment, all, but all governments do. So uh, we just have to recognise that there is a, an envelope for, for um, uh, aviation. Now, I think... If anything, we are moving to be even tougher because there is a real uh, degree of increased um, science about the uh, non-CO2 effects of aviation. The whole question of trails and what that does in the uh, uh, upper air and um, does seem to have a much bigger effect than perhaps people had counted on. So I think the aviation industry has got to understand that the, the science is moving against it and that they will need to work very much harder about sustainability in that industry. Just still on transport, what do you think the future holds for transport infrastructure? I mean, again, Obviously, the COVID situation has sort of recast that a little bit, but that might not be permanent, or, or perhaps it might be. Uh, is it sustainable, in your view, to pursue individualised transport like cars, or do we need to reassess transport and focus on public infrastructure instead? What's your view on that? Well, I think there's no doubt that we're going to have to shift, um, uh, not just in the way you speak, but... Uh, with other things. I mean, we have already said it'd be very much more sensible to use uh, some of the roads budget to improve our uh, internet coverage uh, to make it very good everywhere. I mean, I could, for example, have never spent, as I have over the last six months, I've done my own job running a business. I've uh, been chairman of the Climate Change Committee and chairman of a couple of other businesses. Um, and I've been able to do that from my home in the fastnesses of Suffolk. But a year ago, I couldn't have done it because it's only just now that we've got the proper internet connection. That really needs to be all over the country. I don't think people are going to work in the same way as they did. I think the one permanent change probably is that people will in general want to work two, three days a week at home and going into the office for those other days. Um, and if that's the case, then we've got to have the infrastructure to make that possible. It changes the way that the electricity system works. It changes the way that we need to increase the uh, uh, operation of the internet, a whole range of things of that sort are infrastructure change changes we have to make. Now, we will be moving, and this government has committed itself to it, and I'm very pleased that it has. We will be moving to electric vehicles um, very much quicker than many thought. We, if you remember, it wasn't long ago when they said 2040, and now that's back to 2030. 
32 and maybe even better than that. Now, that means that we'll need roads for those cars to go on it, but it isn't just a question of emissions, it's also a question of congestion. Um, and just by changing the mechanism, um, it doesn't mean to say you deal with the congestion. So I've got several things I think we could do. First of all, do you know that although cars, internal combustion engine cars are much more efficient now than they were 10 years ago, we've wasted all that because people have just bought bigger cars. I mean, there really is no need to have SUVs uh, of the sort that we have and the, the, the problems that they create. And so we really have to think about issues of that sort, much more delicate and different issues from the ones that we have thought up to now. And in my, my own view is that we should, between now and going entirely electric, I think we should be making it significantly more expensive to buy an SUV than to buy a sensible, moderate car, which uh, can be just as safe, um, because that's always the excuse for driving an SUV, can be just as safe, um, but which is not hitting the environment so hard, or adding to the congestion, because all those extra inches of car is more trouble as far as congestion. Secondly, I think there's going to be a lot more uh, delivery to home. I mean, obviously, mail order is becoming a much more important part of our lives. Now, that means we've got to think seriously about all those little vans running around the countryside. I mean, I bought something from a very good company, never bought something from it before, but I ordered it at five o'clock at night and it was there on my doorstep before eight o'clock next morning, and I'm 12 miles from the nearest town. Now that is nonsense. I didn't need it as quickly as that, but it must have meant that a vehicle went at least 12 miles to deliver it to me. And I'm quite sure that they didn't have many other people in our village wanting anything from that particular store at that particular time. So we've got to find clever algorithmic ways of being able to say to people, you can have the delivery, but you pay through the nose to have it um, in an ungreen way. If, you, if you're prepared to have it delivered when we say over the next maybe two or three days, we're not talking about making it long winded, so that you could have an actual route, which meant that you did this in the greenest way and uh, that you really made it increasingly difficult for people to deliver except by electric vehicles um, and a great deal more use of e-bikes in in towns um, and also we must change the law so that you can have uh, what might be thought of as old-fashioned porter uh, carrying i mean there's no reason why we shouldn't have uh, trolleys which are um, uh, directed by an individual for very local delivery. Curiously enough, you've got to have a cab on it under our laws. You can't, uh, we've got, yes, interestingly, if you have an electric thing like that on the streets, you've actually got to have a cab. It doesn't count. Other, we, we just have to change those laws, just as we've already started to think of changing them as far as uh, electric uh, scooters are concerned. That we, We've got to make the laws a to enable the greenest answers in all these transport areas. We've got to use the river more. We've got to make it easier to use the railway because there won't be quite so much um, conventional commuter traffic. There ought to be more room for freight traffic. And as it's that, that's one of our big problems is the availability of uh, space for freight. This will be an opportunity which we ought to take and which I think um, I think rail track is is, is 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 on the way to do. Just want to get to a, a few more questions, um, you know, before we before we finish. And I think it's interesting there you talked about um, the need for the law to catch up with, you know, new developments. And you've obviously got uh, developments in relation um, to combating climate change. You've also got all the, a lot of the post COVID stuff, which I think will have an effect. Uh, on on legislation um, as well. Now I want to return to that, you know, when we sort of conclude, because I think there's some really strong message in there in terms of the way people view the environment. I mean, I was just out earlier on, just walking, uh, uh, and that's all you can do now. The gyms are shut, uh, 
m m many more people are walking and taking advantage of nature. And I know that you know, you're a big advocate of that. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, you mentioned earlier about the financial services sector and the incentives within that sector um, for, um, you know, for funding um, projects that were actually going to uh, get us to net zero. Do you see um, a, a pervading mechanism to implement net zero across government policies and projects, such as like we've seen emerge in the financial services sector? And that question's from Simon Webb. You know, is there something there that, you know, everything that we do has to have that net zero uh, ambit to it? Well, I think, first of all, that everything has to have that. And having a cross government policy of that sort is important and has been improving. And uh, we've tried to help that because now when we do our report on how well the government is doing, we don't just do the cross government report or the government report for Scotland and Wales and the North of Ireland. What we do is to have it um, ministry by ministry, uh, which means that each department, we actually say how well it's done. And I must say, it's already seems to have had an effect for one or two departments that didn't really think it was anything to do with them, but it is to do with every department. I mean, every grant which the department of, uh, uh, DCMS, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. I mean, it should be giving grants only to people who are prepared to use those grants in a way which is environmentally friendly. I mean, that's the kind of way that everybody is part of it. But I do think we probably need also um, some new financial institution uh, which can uh, provide the, um, the, the, uh, with government support which can provide some direction of this um, and help the investment which we need. Uh, uh, it's already true the financial system itself has moved to that direction, but we really do need the government to have something of that sort, which is a kind of successor to the, the Green Bank, which I think we, we could have and ought to have. You mentioned earlier, right at the start actually, uh, about Margaret Thatcher, um, who, was famously the one of the first prime ministers, if not the first, to take climate change seriously. And you obviously worked very closely with her. Since then, in your opinion, which prime minister has been most personally committed to tackling chart climate change and which has been the most effective uh, in doing so, in your opinion? <laughs> oh, I think, I, I think the, the trouble is, uh, one way or another, they've all been defective. I think. <laughs> but I have to say that um, uh, given the things which he got wrong. One does have to say that David Cameron was crucially important in this, um, in, in his leadership in opposition and as prime minister, but above all in his, in his uh, commitment to the Climate Change Act, which is unique in the world. We've now got 12 other countries that are following us doing this. I think it is recognized as the best institutional system that anybody's got anywhere. And so we do have to give him real credit for that. But the fact is, um, prime ministers have been very committed. Mrs. Mrs. May, for example, accepted the concept of net zero and put it through and made sure that it happened. Um, if you look at um, uh, Tony Blair, his, his commitment to, to fighting climate change was notable. And um, it was Gordon Brown who actually put into to, to legislation the um, Climate Change Act. So we haven't had a bad collection of people on this. I, I tell you the two things that have been wrong. One is they're too slow. They have to move fast. And, and, and we now... Um, even more urgent and one of the reasons it is urgent is because at the same time as doing the right things uh david cameron for example didn't continue the zero carbon homes thing the, which was quite wrong but he did uh, through the the chancellor uh, allow 6.7 billion to be spent on building up our offshore wind. So, I mean, the, the thing about life is that nobody's perfect. Uh, what we need now is a prime minister that not only talks about it and does some things, but a prime minister that's prepared to put the whole operation into uh, process. And um, if what 
Boris Johnson has said he is going to do, he does. It may be that on this, whatever else may be true of other things, on this, he may have been the one that will actually seal this for Britain in a world which needs to fight this battle very much indeed. And just talking about sealing it for Britain, and obviously Britain um, being seen on the global stage, really, uh, obviously um, we would have been having COP26 at this very moment in Glasgow. Obviously the pandemic has put pay to that, but obviously that's going to take place all being well next year. What, what are your hopes for COP26? I know that's a big question, but what are your hopes for that? And how do you think Britain can be seen in this particular arena as a result of it? Well, I hope, first of all, that Britain will make its commitment. As you know, this is five years after Paris. This is when um, we ratchet up the commitments. The moment nations are not committed enough to meet what they signed up to in Paris. So we need to ratchet that up. Uh, Mr. Johnson is in a strong position because already China, South Korea, um, Japan uh, have signed up to significant improvements uh, going for net zero. Um, uh, the European Union is going to do that. It's a great pity that we're not part of the European Union. It's a very damaging thing to leave the European Union and we'll find it much more difficult to do what we need to do in this uh, meeting of COP. Um, 26 than we would have done when we led it from within the European Union. But there it is. Um, and now America looks as if it is going to join again the uh, world's battle. So we start off with a good chance. So Britain has got to set an example. So I'm looking forward. They, we will have to give our advice and we'll be doing it very soon. Uh, we will have to give our advice on what the uh, nationally determined contribution will be. Um, and if Britain is prepared to do that very strongly, that will help others. The second thing I'd want to see um, is for us to agree in the future that aviation and shipping should come within uh, the process that we have um, between the nations. Because at the moment, they are left to the shipping organisations, the uh, um, uh, and the uh, and the uh, aviation United Nations aviation organizations separately and they are way behind uh, getting their house in order and therefore I'm very keen that this should become part of our program under the COP system uh, because after all we include it in the net zero you can't you can't pretend that they aren't emissions. You can't uh, put it on one side. So we've really got to begin to take that in. And I hope that the British will lead that to battle. The last thing, um, which are two very big things already, I <laughs> but, but the last thing I hope will happen is that we will find that we will commit ourselves and actually deliver the money that is necessary for the developing countries to be able to play their part. I mean, they've got to jump all that dirty uh, business of uh, fossil fuels into the new world. We have grown rich out of our pollution. That's why we have to pay for it. We've changed the climate and we've grown rich in changing the climate. They are suffering because the poorest always do suffer most. They are suffering for the changes that we've made and they haven't had much of the advantage. And so we've really got to show at COP26 that we are going to deliver on our promises and help those countries to develop in a clean way so that this is a global answer to what is a global solution. And after all, we have a moral duty to do it. We have a practical duty to do it because if we don't do it, then we won't beat climate change. And we've also got a practical reason for doing it because we are going to become a nation which is able to sell our goods, which are going to be net zero goods. They're gonna be zero carbon goods. We wanna sell those throughout the world we want to make it possible for the markets of the developing countries to be able to purchase them. I think uh, 
there's also a health imperative, isn't there? And I know that the um, Climate Change Committee has just recently commissioned and published some detailed research on the potential benefits to public health of uh, tackling climate change. And I was really pleased to think, I think you worked with Michael Marmot on that particular um, particular report. I think that's something that needs to be stressed more and more, actually, in relation to to climate uh, to climate change, because it is a health issue, isn't it? Well, it is. So. COVID should have taught us that because Indeed. what we've done to the world has brought us far too close to particular elements of the animal world because we've excluded them by destroying their habitat. And therefore, the interrelation is probably one of the reasons for COVID itself. And certainly, there are many other diseases which are hanging there because we have so mistreated the planet which gives us life. So there's a there's that kind of health issue. But there's also the increasing knowledge that we now have that the um, uh, dirty air, the, the air quality is a really serious damaging thing with children with asthma and uh, increasing numbers of uh, respiratory diseases. And it's certainly true that COVID has killed many more people because it's linked with bad air quality and their respiratory problems. So we know that even if, even if you weren't doing it for climate change, you should be doing it for health. And again, we come back to this awful thing is that the poorest always suffer, suffer most. It's the crowded place, places in the cities where the, where the air is worse, where the children are less well nourished, where the children are less able to get out into the air, where there are fewer parks and fewer open spaces. Just um, finally, I, I, I always of, often ask this question, and you touched on it slightly uh, earlier on about our industry um, in particular. You know, obviously, you someone who is has a wide experience of government uh, uh, at the very highest level. Do you think that our industry is vocal enough in bringing those solutions to the table of which you spoke earlier on on the issue of climate change, not just? complaining but actually bringing issues should the industry be much more vocal than it is in your opinion i think it should be much more vocal and united i think the big issue for the infrastructure industry construction industry itself has always been that it's never been quite securely single-minded with one voice it tends to have contrary and differing voices and and, and the fact is, there is no need for that. Uh, you should argue out your problems inside and then give one answer to government. Uh, when I was the Secretary of State responsible for this, I finally sent the construction industry away and said, you've got five different voices. <laughs> and I, if I listen to all five of you, I then make up my own mind. I mean, you don't actually influence me at all because you've all got different answers go away and have one voice and then I'll listen to it and I'd be much more likely to follow it. So I think that's true of any minister. If you want to get uh, a solution which will benefit your industry and you know more about it than government ever will and politicians ever will, I've always believed that you should keep the industry out of the hands of politicians. Well, the way you do that is to provide the politicians with an answer which you all agree on and which you are actually going to deliver. Do that and you've won the battle. Lord Deben, we've run out of time. Uh, absolutely fantastic uh, conversation and discussion uh, and really, really appreciate you taking time out today to, uh, to, answer, to answer my questions uh, on, a whole, uh, on a whole range of issues and some really good um, advice. It's not the first time we've heard that the industry is too fragmented uh, I'm bound to say, and obviously that's something speaking with one voice that we need to do uh, much more of. It's one of the things we try to do in infrastructure intelligence, uh, of course, as well. And, and in having those discussions on a, on, on a multiplicity of issues, uh, we try and get some clarity uh, at the end of it. But thank you very much again for your input. The best of luck in, in all that you do uh, and the Committee on Climate Change's reports that are coming up. Um, we, we can see that the government is starting to listen on these issues and it is an issue that's absolutely vital to uh, you know to the whole to the whole of uh, whole of society
Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, a reminder that our next In the Spotlight interview is on the 20th of November, uh, where we have the Chief Executive of the Royal Town Planning Institute, Victoria Hills. Lord Deben, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.